Um, a warm welcome to everyone. My name is Brett Thielen. I'm the science director with the Harris Center for Conservation Education. And along with the Loon Preservation Committee, we're sponsoring tonight's talk. For those of you who might be new to the Harris Center, I do want to just say a few um, words of introduction and welcome. Uh, the Harris Center for Conservation Education is a nonprofit organization based in the Monadnock region of Southwest New Hampshire, where we help people fall in love with the natural world through land protection, conservation research, and education of all ages. So those of you who are local to New Hampshire or Vermont um, might be interested to know we've now protected more than 25,000 acres of land from development. Much of that is open for hiking, birding, and other recreation. Um, we coordinate conservation research on those conserved lands and also throughout the region, um, including a variety of really fun community science projects focused on wildlife. And then at the heart of everything we do um, is education for all ages from babies in backpacks to residents of retirement communities and all points in between. Last year, we offered more than 150 events for the public, um, including Zoom talks like this one. With that, I think um, we'll get to the, the big event for tonight. Um, I'm really excited to welcome John Cooley tonight to um, speak with us. I've long admired his work. He um, is a senior biologist with the Loon Preservation Committee, lives in Sandwich, um, has worked, he'll tell us how many years, but many, many years studying loons um, and got his uh, master's degree in conservation biology from Antioch University, New England as well. And tonight we're here, um, we often think of loons as a summertime experience for us humans who like to watch and listen to them. And, um, they are very present on our lakes in the summer, and sometimes they stay a little longer. And so John is here tonight to talk about um, his kind of daring adventures, um, rescuing loons um, who, who stay a little too long on New Hampshire lakes. So with that, um, I'm going to welcome you all and turn it over to John. Brett. Um, and hello, everybody. I'm gonna share my screen. Uh, thank you everybody for coming out tonight or zooming in and uh, to the Harris Center uh, and Brett for thinking of this topic and, and um, inviting it. A lot of the folks that I'm seeing sign in are, are people who've helped with these rescues. And um, so I'm looking forward to quickly getting through the information I have for you and leaving time for good discussion and questions as much as I can. Um, as Brett said, I, I've worked at the Loon Center since 2005 as a biologist. And um, by way of introduction, I've got this um, picture, a sunset picture of the closest uh, Loon territory to my home in Sandwich, Red Hill Pond. This is from an evening a couple summers ago when we were headed out to capture and ban the adult loons on Red Hill Pond. And, and those two loons, I've included it here as, as a connection to my neighborhood, but also because those both of those adult loons will feature in, in the stories about winter rescues that I, that I wanna share. I also wanna share, in addition to the winter rescue details, a little context to start with about LPC. We've been around since the 1970s. Um, and our work to recover and protect the loon population has included tools like this loon nest draft. Last year, we floated 140 of these and about a quarter of the loon ticks that hatch in New Hampshire come from rafts like this. We float nest signs at vulnerable nest sites and almost half of the ticks that are hatched these days come from a nest that was protected in this way. And we've also focused on adult mortality from ingested lead fishing tackle. This is a major problem because individual loons can uh, live for decades. And the, so the annual loss of just a small handful of those can cast a long, a long shadow on population recovery. Um, this, is a, this is a real focus for us. Uh, and in spite of uh, recent first in the nation uh, state laws to ban the use and sale of lead fishing tackle. We're still collecting three to 10 adult loons or so a year that have died of this cause. Um, so it's a work in progress. Um, but let's focus on um, preventing adult mortality is an obvious segue to the, the benefit of the loon rescues I'll be talking about tonight, a uh, good comparison. 
all this work keeps us busy. And um, at the end of a, another busy loom field season, when I get together with family over the holidays, um, one of the questions, a perennial question is how the loons are doing. And as I answer that, it's satisfying to be able to point to ponds like this one, where uh, in Sandwich Notch on Upper Hall Pond, we've, we've started to have nesting loons in the last few years. This is a place where the population is um, evidencing the slow, intensively managed recovery towards historical carrying capacity. 10, 20 years ago, you wouldn't have found loons nesting here. But now in the summertime, you'll find um, a pair of loons nesting on this island. And um, when the same family member or friend asks um, what I do this time of year as, as the loons are gone, uh, from the breeding lakes, I I can uh, pull out my phone and show them a picture of a ski ex ski excursion uh, like the one I was on when I took the photo. This was a few years ago, March uh, 2020. So uh, that and desk work and planning for the next season is our usual gig this time of year at the Loon Center. And my stories tonight are going to show you a few exceptions to that to that usual winter lull. That, that needed uh, break in the action. So this is another winter scene uh, taken last month, Keezer Lake, Sutton, New Hampshire. And you can see here, the loon has not left. It's in this little open patch of uh, water. And I wanna give you this example, just to give you the, the initial feel for what these rescues are like. Um, but then I'll talk more about what, uh, what leads up to that. So I've got some video here. We'll see how this plays. <laughs> This is uh, also illustrating how much our techniques are evolving. <laughs> as, as we got to Keezer Lake was my first really unsuccessful attempt to approach the loon. And I don't know if you saw it, but the loon was diving contentedly well out of uh, reach from the net. And the ice was so thin, there was no way to maneuver across it to where the loon was. So uh, here's the next clip. Nice, John. You can hear my coworker Caroline in the background. <laughs> this is the first uh, ice oh, rescue I've done cool. with a kayak like this, <laughs> and probably the last. Hopefully, it's a little bit awkward. Um, but the um, the method here, the the kayak came from bystanders who, realizing the need, were able to go and fetch one on a moment's notice. You can see the gill net in the boat, and as I got back to shore. Um, Nice job. Go ahead to the next slide. I handed the loon to Caroline, and then um, I don't know if you'll see my hand sort of clasped, uh, possibly in a momentary prayer that we could get the net untangled. Um, but th this, uh, so in the end, we found a way that worked. And um, the next step, once we're back to shore, is to get this loon to the veterinarian to consult with our uh, veterinary expert Mark Pokris and uh, wildlife rehabilitator Maria Colby, and then happily, in this case, off to the coast that very afternoon to be released on saltwater where it should have been to start with. So, um, in sharing a few more examples uh, of these winter rescues, I want to uh, explain how this fourth season of loon work has really become an extension of the other ways that we've gone about protecting loons. And this is a good point, you know, I want to answer the questions. Why, why do loons get iced in? Why are we intervening? How does that fit with what we're doing the rest of the year? And what are we finding out? And this is a good point to just do a quick review of winter loon biology. You can see here a map of the locations on the New England coastline where loons have been recited in the winter or recovered after being originally banded on the freshwater lakes during the summer breeding season. And really for our loons in New Hampshire, it's all up and down the New England coast. This summarizes oh, 20, 25 years of, of band recoveries and recites. And it needs to be updated a little bit. I mentioned Red Hill Pond as, as I started that sunset picture. Um, last March, we got this photo from Queens, New York of the Red Hill Pond female. So she breeds right in here in the middle of the map. And she was all the way down in New York City, a stone's throw from the Statue of Liberty. Um, and um, we knew it from the photographer's 
picture of her bands, but here's a picture that shows you those same two yellow bands on the nest from a game camera that was put out there in, in 2020. And um, this illustrates sort of the fine scale detail we're getting about individual loons, both in the winter and summer. And the mate of this female loon will, will come up as, a, as another individual in, this, in the examples that I have. So the winter time is uh, by late fall, really, the time when the loons, adult loons have lost their breeding plumage. You can see the little bit of residual black and white speckling there, but they're in this drab winter plumage. And um, they're also midwinter about this time of year, January, late January, undergoing a, a wing molt. You'll recall that loons are dense diving birds with relatively small wings to begin with, even on a good day with full set of flight feathers, they need a hundred yards or so to take off. And they can't move around easily on dry land or, and they certainly can't take off. So they need usually a five or 10 acre pond at minimum to feed on, to nest on as their habitat. And this is why if the sudden arrival of ice on a lake and their confinement in a small bit of open water is problematic. And it's all the more a problem if they're um, in the middle of what they've evolved to do in midwinter, this, this simultaneous molt. Usually that happens on the ocean. They can drop their feathers and it renders them flightless for about a month. On the ocean, they don't need to fly around. They can just hang out in an estuary or up and down the coastline. But if they've um, stuck around on the lakes, until the small begins, uh, then they're really committed. There's no way they could leave even if they wanted to. Here's a picture of a wing mole happening up close in one of the loons we rescued. Um, and I'll talk more about that one. Given the uh, sort of fundamental need that loons have to go ahead and get gone, off to the coast as the days get short, the fact that they really don't have an option if they stick around until January. Um, are, are, you know, the perennial question is why some loons do stay and get stuck. And there's a couple intuitive sort of obvious answers to that. Um, it's a natural sort of demographic or energetic hurdle in their life cycle, this point where the lakes freeze over so that if they're debilitated by injury or disease, um, this may be the last straw. They may be sort of doomed um, to perish on, on uh, without being able to migrate. And then for the juvenile loons that were hatched last summer, the other thing that we always wonder as we see them get iced in is, is how good their instincts are, whether maybe just uh, the, res the uh, response to the appropriate response to migratory cues is absent in that juvenile loon. And as um, Brett alluded to, in the introduction, the, the other thing that's on our mind these days is that um, climate change may be weakening the usual migratory cues. And so some of the ice in loons we're seeing may be um, reflecting uh, a shifting response to those weaker cues. There's also some bad luck involved in some of the cases. Injury can include injury from humans. So this is a, a, the radiograph or x-ray of a iced in loon that was um, shot, had a, a bullet in its, near its shoulder. There can be natural injuries too. And by way of example for that first category, I wanna mention this uh, adult loon that was rescued in 2016 on Winnipesaukee by this kite sailor, Lee Spiller. He's actually, you can't see it in the picture, but he's got the loon under his arm there as he skates along. And when we took a look at the loon, you can barely see it in this photo. It was a banded male that we knew well from Winnipesaukee. He had been banded in 1999. So he was in you know roughly 20 years old, at least minimum age at the time of this rescue. And he came in the door uh, as, as he was rescued, really emaciated. And in fact, uh, over the weeks that he was at the rehabilitators, diseased enough that there was no way to treat, uh, treat his, his ailment and he, he did not survive. So we'd had uh, though long history of watching him on the lake. He was uh, at one territory successfully breeding for a decade and then bumped 
the next territory down. The summer before he was rescued, here's a picture of him and his mate with two chicks hatched on yet a third territory. And his condition as he was rescued and this long history kind of fit the profile of, of, of maybe being uh, at the end of his uh, natural breeding lifespan, perhaps this uh, stranding on the ice signaled his, his final senescence. Lee Spiller, the head sailor here in the lawn chair holding this adult loon was also involved in that other category of juvenile loons who may not know enough to leave when they should a couple of years before that on Squam Lake, Lee took these pictures of another ice skater uh, who's holding this loon that they found uh, as the ice had just formed. And um, Nordic skaters have become our real allies in alerting us to um, need for an ice rescue in some of these cases. The juvenile loons, the young of the year, um, they may not have the appropriate migratory instinct, but also they could be subject to the same injuries or diseases that the adults are. Um, maybe this loon was coming into the winter calendar with a cumulative deficit, uh, could have been lower on the pecking order in a two chick brood, for example. But these kind of chronic causes, uh, we would imagine always being present in the population. So a good question is what the history of reported ISINs is, has this always been going on under our noses and we're only now um, becoming more aware of it or trying to respond to it? If you look back in the mid 20th century, there's an interesting account from a naturalist in Northwest Territories, Canada, mentioning that loons do get frozen in even there in the heart of the loons range. And then uh, even earlier in the 19th century, there's this compelling, disturbing, um, anecdote of uh, somebody crossing one of the lakes there midwinter, finding all the loons in the country assembled in one small hole in the ice. And as a hunter, killing 30 of them barehanded um, in the course of an hour. Um, so this is, illustrates how much times have changed, of course. And you can see in the title, the, the ornithologist gave to his piece in Forest and Stream there in 1874, A Lunatic on Ice, that there was a little bit of dismay registering even in that era. Um, but uh, the point here is that probably some loons have been getting iced in and even groups of loons have been getting iced in for time immemorial. And we have to fit what we, what we figure out about the trends in with that, uh, that probable history. So to get uh, the recent history, I wanna shift gears, um, having given you some context on, on the background winter biology of loons and, and, and those historical accounts um, to the recent era. And that really started uh, on Winnipesaukee in 2007, when uh, the lake froze over, um, as it did this year, or as it will hopefully do this year at the end of January, so relatively late compared to average. And uh, around Valentine's Day in mid-February, a group of snowmobilers were crossing the broads and came across almost a couple dozen loons. Five of them were still alive, but the rest had, had frozen. And um, those five were, were rescued by a fish and game conservation officer who housed them in the DOT garage in Guilford overnight. Our director here at LPC, Harry Vogel, gave them a ride to the coast the next day. And we went out and found the rest that hadn't made it on, on the snow in the middle of the lake, um, drift, sort of drifted over, really poignant scene. Um, but basically we found, about the, found out about this, they'd probably been out there for a couple of weeks uh, once the lake froze after the fact, just by chance. And uh, you'll see as I, as I share a few more examples that our ability to track these events has changed. We were more alert for sure after 2007 on Winnie. We actually did a flyover of Winnie the next year in a small plane to make sure there weren't any loons left at that point. But there was a series of um, individual ISINs uh, in the subsequent years that are worth mentioning. This, in 2008 on um, Sondagerty Pond in Northfield shows you 
um, the rescue of a loon that turned out at the vets to have been shot in, in the wing. That's why it couldn't fly off the pond. And the person in the yellow suit there is a, is a fireman from the Northfield Fire Department. So they performed the rescue. I'm happily, safely, dryly on shore here, watching through binoculars. So those were the early days. We continue to work with fire departments uh, where they're available. This is a, a crew from a fire department in Maine rescuing the loon you can see here uh, just last year. But mostly, especially in those initial years, it's been a sort of do-it-yourself operation. This is from Orange Pond, Canaan, New Hampshire in 2010. And you can see here, I've left the shore, I'm out on the ice holding uh, closely to the boat. This method didn't really work. Jim Collins uh, was the volunteer there and was braver than I was, but neither of us could get close to the loom. And Jim asked, actually rescued it the following day when it tried to take off over the ice. Here it is being released uh, down in Biddeford, Maine. And uh, again, um, in 2013, another small pond, this was an adult loon, had been banded previously. So we're starting to get information on where these loons were coming from. Um, and at this point, out on the ice um, with the boat, support me, I was actually able to, to nab the loon once it started scooting across the ice. And we were able in the following summer to document that this loon came back as a banded loon. So it was around this, this time that we started to really make every effort we could to ban the loons if they were getting released. And again, another informative case uh, in the following year, 2014 from Martin Meadow Pond. This was a banded loon. It was originally banded in 2000. So in 2014 had uh, 14 years of breeding plus probably at least six years to reach adulthood and win a territory. So again, like the Alakoya loon I showed you that the kite sailor had found um, at least probably 20 years old. And so it was easy as we rescued this loon to imagine that it was another one that was sort of at the end of its natural long reproductive lifespan. But lo and behold, at the, at the vets, you could see in this x-ray, the fishing tackle that the loon had swallowed had a slightly elevated lead level, uh, 13 micrograms per deciliter, but below the 20, 20 microgram clinical threshold. And so at Avian Haven, they were able to flush the tackle out of the loon and, and administer chelating medications and release it. And um, although, it, and it came back the next year. It was bumped off its territory by another male for a year, but uh, won the territory back in 2016 and ever since has been producing young back in the breeding population. So this was a real eye opener to us. We're not used to being able to um, treat lead poisoning in loons. We had a couple other cases since then that have made us think that perhaps winter instances of lead poisoning may, for whatever reason, be a little more treatable. This is a, a loon rescued on Highland Lake in Stoddard in 2016, a young of the year that had elevated lead. Another one in 2016 from Pogus Bay, Laconia, again, a juvenile, was also treated and released. And you can see a little refinement here. We're stretching a, a tarp over the hole to try and narrow the opening down so it's easier to, to catch the loan. As I get to 2016 though, it's a good point to uh, show you the trajectory for the increase in the number of ice rescues over the last decade. And um, I'm gonna hone in on instances that make up these, these taller bars of groups of loons uh, getting stuck. There's something interesting about them. But you can see overall that, that the numbers are, are going up. And in 2016, after the stranding on, on Winnipesaukee in 2007, um, the Nordic skaters, um, once again, were, were extremely helpful in alerting us when they were out exploring the new ice on Sunapee Lake in January and discovered three loons. Later, we went out to rescue these three. We found another couple in a separate little opening. Um, but by the end of the day, we had, you know, um, 
a happy crew and five loons uh, rescued off the ice and, and headed again to uh, eventually to the coast. Um, this, this Nordic skating community was so helpful with this rescue, not just in reporting, but in standing out there and in hauling the gear and just generally uh, lending a hand. So it was, a, it was a great team effort. We were all happy at the end of the day. And um, this is the picture I showed you earlier that, that found that, and this was um, January 26th, so just about now in the year, these looms were already growing new primary uh, feathers. So they were already most of the way through, or at least halfway through their wing mold. So they weren't going anywhere when, when the lake froze. Here's the picture of one of them uh, getting released out of the transport box on Penobscot Bay after a brief triage at Avian Haven. And then there was a, after they were all released, they grouped up out on the bay. This is a nice send off. And um, although one of the loons, one of those five had untreatable lead poisoning, one of them had been banded down on Sand Pond in 1998. And we were really excited to see him back on his breeding territory. Uh, Millen Pond in Washington the following summer and subsequently. And there've been a couple of other loons in that group of five from Sunapee that we've also recited on breeding lakes in New Hampshire um, after they survived and came back. So 2016 was sort of a, a watershed year in that we got more equipment, this yellow dry suit. That's not, that's actually uh, Harry Vogel, our director headed out the following winter. Um, towards another loon that was, or several loons that were stranded on Sunapi. Um, they weren't able to get those loons rescued. But again, we were working with the New London Fire Department and we continue to just refine our coordination of these, of these rescues. Um, part of that coordination has been closer work with um, partner programs in the Northeast Loon Study Work Group and beyond. Um, we're all, taking on this fourth season nowadays. That, so that's Nina Schock and the ACLC folks. This is a couple loons from Lake George that were rescued with them last year and down um, on the lower uh, corner. I gotta go back to that slide, but down on the lower right corner on Lake Champlain, they rescued a few. I like the picture of the canoe rescue and my colleague, Eric Hansen in Vermont has been involved this was in 2016 on Lake Champlain, uh, where eight loons were rescued, a group there. And this uh, photo of three people out on a lake is from Easer Lake in Lovell, Maine last winter, where colleagues from Biodiversity Research Institute rescued five juvenile loons all in the same afternoon. So there, again, we're, we're all taking on this work, finding that there's, there's instances where it's, uh, there's a real purpose to it. And national um, virtual meetings of the Loon Rescue and Rehab Working Group have been another source of uh, discussion expertise uh, in that. And especially the input of, of Kevin and Linda Grenzer uh, out in Wisconsin, they've sort of made a, 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 it's just a real passion for them, the, the rescue enterprise. They've developed modified equipment. Um, they've advised us on, on how to use a gill net. And I wanna show you this video of their hovercraft um, where Come on. very thin ice. Oh, so close. They've been able to go out and rescue yeah. loons with all, all kinds of uh, basically different contraptions. Um, it just is um, a good demonstration that we are not alone here in New Hampshire in doing this work, or which can feel crazy at times. Uh, it's it's been a real uh, collective effort across the programs throughout the breeding range, and we're all learning from each other's experiments as we do this. Um, and the, and the lessons that we've been learning have been. Um, all, all, all applied uh, as we go. So especially in this final example, I'll show you from Winnipesaukee, exactly a year ago today, the 24th of January, 2022, 
um, you'll see we're using some of these techniques. Again, Nordic skaters were out on the ice the weekend before we actually could rescue these loons, but as they explored, it had been a really cold weekend. And so there were four to six inches of, of nice brand new black ice. You can see the track the skaters made, which they provided to me to show um, where they'd found the loons. Um, but as they, as they came to this uh, sort of huge Olympic swimming pool size patch of open water, you can just see the 10 loons in the back of it knew something was up, that that wasn't the right place for, for loons to be this time of year. And um, so they got in touch. And we spent a week headed out checking on these loons. It, was, it wasn't a very cold week, and so the ice didn't close in on them. And um, so repeatedly we were out there to check. By the end of the week, we were getting anxious enough to help loons that we made a premature attempt and so we were out there with fish and game conservation officers and the Tuffman Borough Fire Department and their airboat, stretch a gill net across this water, didn't work at all, the loon stove right under it. And um, we had to wait another couple nights with below zero temperatures until going out in the morning, we found that the loons were really confined to a small, this is perhaps five meters across uh, opening. The ice around it on the inside is really pretty thin, but um, this was good enough to get out and, and, and use the gill net for most of them over the course of the day. This is Caroline Hughes here and uh, Tiffany Grotti. We just reeled them in one after the other. The last loom was a little bit hard to get. <laughs> Caroline finally getting it. It was not wanting to be caught. Um, but we ended up at the end of the afternoon with, you know, sledfuls of loons, 10 loons total. Here's Harry carting them back to shore. It was about a mile out. And the photographer who took some of these pictures and had come out with us was dedicated. That's him lying on the ice right next to the open water waiting for the perfect sunset shot. These loons, one of them had, um, pretty high levels of lead poisoning um, above what we'd usually try and treat, but um, the chelating medications brought the lead level down. And um, after 24 to 48 hours with Maria Colby and, and many pounds of bait fish, all 10 loans were released at Odeorn Point in Rye um, a couple days later. Here's our seacoast field biologist, Olivia and Caroline, uh, releasing one of them. And this was um, an incredibly satisfying team effort. Here's all the empty boxes after the loons were in the water. And a happy crew, Maria, the rehabilitators is on the left here. And uh, at one point or another during the rescue, every member, of our, of our LPC staff, our year round staff uh, was involved in, in helping with the rescue. So the folks in, in our membership department, our Loon Center manager, Kelly there in the red jacket, um, some of the regular Loon Center volunteers who help run our gift shop, um, they all had a chance uh, along with the rest of us field staff to um, help out and to take part. And um, it, it was a, it was really satisfying to, to get everybody included uh, in that. And that's the flavor of these rescues in general. Usually they're off in some remote part of the lake uh, state. So the volunteers involved are, are not uh, close at hand, are not our Loon Center staff, but um, by and large, we're uh, able to get good teams going on these rescues at, the, at, at a moment's notice. And I like this photo of, of Maria Colby watching over uh, the last few loons headed out of the little cove we used to release them onto the salt water at the end of that day. So in last year, 2022, our, our fourth season included this uh, big group of rescue loons. And uh, that was the end of January. And so it was really our, our off season came as much as it did, our time for desk work and, 
backcountry skiing came in um, February. That was that's sort of the new fifth season on the calendar. Um, and I want to um, leave time for folks' questions about how these rescues work. But just to summarize, having shared some examples, uh, some of the findings uh, that have come from that, um, I hope I hope that'll prime the pump for, the, for your questions. One thing we found, we've at this point over the the uh, decade and a half that I've shared with you, um, we've rescued just over fifty loons uh, from these iced in settings. You know, note that the winter rescues include sometimes include a a loon that's stranded on dry land, and I, I haven't talked about those. But purely the the loons that got iced in, it's just over fifty, and um, so it's 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 turning into a. Um, great useful data set on uh, the health of these loons, their contaminant burdens, um, where they've come from and where they go after we release them uh, once they're banded and whether they survive or not, or if they do survive, uh, what their persistence is on the landscape. And um, we wouldn't, we don't usually, usually the winter time is completely inaccessible and unstudied as far as loon, uh, these loon, um, questions go in this aspect of loon conservation. We just can't catch and sample a loon at this point in the year any other way. So it's giving us a, a really unique window into this part of the uh, season and into this part of the population. Our summer uh, research, our summer sampling is um, by default focused on the loons we can sample and mark in the summer, and those are the healthiest, fittest, successful breeding loans, the fittest part of the population. We really can't easily band a, an unpaired adult loon or a loon that's in marginal health. It's not susceptible to our, our banding techniques. So when we get them iced in in the winter time and we can mark them or, or um, evaluate them, we're, we're suddenly getting a lot of insight into questions we couldn't answer otherwise. And as we do that, we're finding that the same stressors that plague the loon population in the summer are still present in the winter too. So of those 50 odd loons that we've rescued, five or 10% of them have had elevated blood lead levels, have had lead poisoning. And um, it's the lower end, the 5% that have actually, as they present with the elevated blood lead level, also have the ingested fishing tackle still present and evidence of that. Presumably the other ones are likely to have gotten the lead in their systems from lead tackle, but there's no way to be absolutely sure. But we know that lead tackle is a problem in the winter time too, at a pretty appreciable rate. And we're also encouraged to find that the release rates for not only the lead poison loan that can be treated, in the winter time sometimes, but uh, the winter rescue loons in general are higher than the summer rescues. So Isen and the catastrophe for the loon of being stranded at Isen is a little less um, apocalyptic or, or severe than, um, than for a, a beach loon in the summertime. There's just a better chance Lot, um, better odds that, that the loon can be treated or doesn't even need treatment and can be released. And we also are, um, as we finish each fourth season of these ice rescues, really keenly aware that the number of rescues we're doing is increasing. It's adding more fun to our, our winter work, um, but um, we want to look uh, I want to talk a little bit about why why that is. Um, for one thing, there's more reporting from the public, from our loon volunteers on the lakes, from the Nordic skating community, on other people recreating, and and there's a, a better capacity to respond on the part of our organization. So we we've just we're making a better effort to get out there and intervene. There's also more loons now than there were uh, 15 years ago. So the population has increased by 15 or 20 percent, and depending on what part of the state you're in, 
And so it's reasonable that we'd see a few more loans in absolute numbers getting stranded. And then the, um, the million dollar question is whether we're actually just seeing an increase in the rate of these winter ice strandings per capita. If more, more loons per capita are getting stuck, maybe they're even being um, miscued by a warming climate. Maybe the, the things that prompt them to migrate in the fall aren't as, as strongly present as cues for them. Now that, for example, in this year, um, and in a lot of recent years, the ice in is later and um, the air temperatures in November and December and January are a couple degrees on average warmer than usual. So this illustrates the uh, effect of climate warming on ice cover on Lake Champlain, this graph, it shows you this amazing long-term record that's available on Lake Champlain and how over the last 50 years or so, we've gone um, through the roof to the point where in many recent years, uh, the, the lake doesn't freeze over at all. If there was really a subset of loons in the population that could take advantage of a warmer winter and less ice cover, um, we would sort of expect to find them overwintering at least some of the time whenever the, the weather was warmer, not just when in the long term global climate change and climate warming was, was making all winters warmer, but just in the occasional winters. And in fact, uh, if you look beyond the Northeastern US to this great monograph of, of uh, loon life history in British Columbia, um, there's a, a really intriguing map here of February loon sightings that shows you this cluster of inland freshwater lakes where in February, midwinter, um, as often as not, you're likely to be able to find a loon present. This, this is reporting on uh, about 50 years worth of sightings um, but their their claim is that in most years you can find overwintering loons in this area. And the other intriguing claim that this is made in this monograph is that the, the rate of uh, those overwintering loons being present has increased over time. So this is really supporting the idea that uh, loons might be able to do this when the open water is available. We look at our own rescues again, and especially the group of 10 from Winnipesaukee, you'll see that um, a number of the loons we released on the coast after rescuing them on Winnie um, actually came back this summer. And one of the key findings that we have is that um, these, these iced in loons are not necessarily doomed. They can come back. And in the case of Orange Pond, Red Hill Pond and Purity Lake, Again, here's Red Hill Pond figuring in the story. Um, these were male loons that were previously banded before being rescued. And as they came back this summer, they picked up and continued to breed, nesting successfully on Purity Lake and Orange Pond. Um, so they're, they're a part, a viable part of the breeding population. On Mary Meeting Lake, part of a breeding pair. So um, it would make sense if some of these individuals um, had a stake in staying longer in the winter, perhaps, or finding a place where they could end up closer to their breeding territory in the spring. The other piece that supports that, and I'll, I'll wrap up here so there's time for questions, is that um, the vast majority of all the loons we've been finding in these large groups, Winnipesaukee in 07, Sonopee 2016, and last year on Winnie again, the vast majority are male loons. So if there's some sex differential in their territorial behavior, we know male loons are, tend to arrive back on the breeding territories first in the spring. Maybe there's a piece to their uh, winter phenology or just their instinct to migrate that would allow some plasticity and let them stay. Maybe they'd have to be a little bit under the weather or predisposed to do that by some disadvantage in terms of their energetics for migrating, but um, maybe they could make it work and, and to their advantage. So maybe this is uh, in South Carolina, there's a lake, Jocassi Lake, that uh, is, is routinely a spot where, where loons overwinter. And maybe what we're seeing on Winnie is uh, Jocassi, lake, lake Jocassi North. 
Um, this is a picture from 2017, February 2017 of Winnipesaukee. And in that year, we didn't have to rescue any loons, but going out on the ice and checking throughout the winter, there was one loon present who overwintered on what uh, the 50 or 100 acres that stayed open uh, throughout the winter. And that was a first as far as we know. So as the climate continues to warm, maybe part of the ice strandings that we're seeing reflect um, the loons that are pushing the envelope, waiting to take advantage of or, or needing to take advantage of uh, the chance to make it through another winter on the inland freshwater lake. Again, to summarize um, these findings, um, we are amazed that some of the rescue loons are surviving and returning and continuing to breed at the rate they are. And I hope it's been clear that <laughs> our rescue techniques and methods are evolving, they're collaborative, we're learning every time we go out. And most of all, I wanna make sure it's clear that the, um, the, the effort that's going into this is, is full of support from uh, across our LPG staff and volunteers, but the veterinary expertise uh, of Dr. Mark Pokert, especially in local clinics, uh, Maria Colby and other rehabilitators, the great fire police and fish and game personnel who um, are on standby or in this picture help carry the gear back up from the lake. And then our, our colleagues and other programs who are um, troubleshooting the, the effort with us. So I'm hoping that leaves, I, on my, as I'm monitoring uh, the time left here, I'm hope I know I, I haven't taken into account the, the pause we had at the start to get the, um, the screen right, but I'm hoping this leaves still a little bit of time for questions. And I'll go ahead and stop sharing so that I can see, um, see people's chat and questions. There are questions and some of them came just to me too. So um, first of all, thank you. That was fascinating. Just incredible, incredible to think about uh, the, the photos, the videos, the whole story of it all is just really incredible. So thank you for sharing. Um, there are a bunch of questions that came in to me. Um, the first one is kind of a, what can we do? So if, if we see a loon that we are concerned about, when should we be concerned and what, ha what should we do? Do you call the loon center? Do we email you? Do you want pictures if we can get them? Like what, how should we be looking out for? Yeah, that's a great question. And the brief answer is that um, we spend a lot of time in late fall reassuring folks <laughs> who have seen their loon hanging out longer than it probably should have. But like, um, like any good procrastinator still able to get the job done when push comes to shove. And um, uh, so 90, 95% of the loons that we are seeing uh, or that somebody notices on the lake, even in December, do take off as, as the ice comes in. So it's worth letting us know. We have a, a report form on our website at loon.org that lets people submit a, a loon in distress report. And that's convenient because it comes to our email inbox and, and we can log it there. You can add a photo if you want. Um, but that's a good easy way to let uh, LPC know if you're in New Hampshire. And, um, and then we really don't worry about the loon until the ice has truly formed and the loon is, is socked in and just a little bit of opening because in a lot of cases, we had one case a few weeks ago where um, on Loon Pond in Gilmanton, um, there were two juvenile loons stuck. And the morning we went out to rescue them, one of them took right off from this tiny little opening. So they can really do that sometimes in a pinch. And um, there's always a little bit of hope until they're really truly stuck. Um, that relates to another question um, that, that um, was asked about how do you deal with them diving? I know you're waiting until the ice gets smaller and smaller, but are there concerns that they might dive and then get trapped under the ice? Yes, that's a, a, a real, that's a, um, a small but real risk. And I've read accounts of that happening to a fire department out in Colorado, Fort Collins one year. 
it's happened to me once and um i don't know why the that particular loon got startled in that way because for the time there's been many times when we've at the scene been worried that that's what had happened because the loon dives and doesn't come up for moments you know many moments and then finally it surfaces and they seem as you'd expect to be so adept at locating and keeping track of the opening um it just it it um they they don't you it doesn't usually happen it's extremely rare um but it is a real risk and and we take some pains as we're approaching the loans to slow down um sometimes we'll hoot a little bit to communicate you know that we're you know not at least not a predator even if they don't know what we are <laughs> um but just do everything we can to keep them sort of chill and relaxed as much as we can and um yeah it's the the other thought there is that for most of these loans um they're doomed if we don't rescue them so it's worth taking that slight risk um but it was the time that it happened to me it was awful <laughs> yeah. yeah um there was a question it sounds like you're banding most or maybe all of these loons that are winter rescues so i guess one question is do you band them all and the follow-up is have there been any that needed repeat rescues winter rescues Yes, at this point, we're marking every single one that we can. We're going to great lengths. You know, we'll drive, you know, a half a day out of our way to get to the release site to make sure that that loon gets banded because we're so eager to document what happens to them after that. And um, I do want to say that we've rescued one banded loon twice but i am not positive on that in new hampshire i know in new york state on lake george and lake champlain there's been an iced in loon that got it iced in twice <laughs> so um that does happen yep um okay there's maybe time for a couple more one question is can you talk a little bit about why this is necessary like all of this trouble for just one bird or a small handful of birds. And I know it's not that simple, but I'm hoping you can shed some light on the, why every loon counts in this case. Yeah, there's just, I mean, it's a good question. <laughs> and um, the first part of that is simply that um, because loons are rare and threatened and because of their life history, um, as I explained with the problem of um, lead mortality from ingested lead fishing tackle, um, just losing a small handful of loons or saving a small handful of loons can really make a long difference in the long run to the recovery and the viability of the population. So you don't have to lose many loons, you don't have to save many loons to really um, tip the scales in terms of the long-term population growth. And um, so that's that's part of it. It really is worthwhile and, and in, in uh, doing the ice rescues, so for example, with the 10 loons that, that we rescued on Winnie last year, if only three to five of those actually survive in the long run, um, we've still offset in that one rescue the all the lead mortalities we collected in, in that year. And so that's a that's you know, that's something. <laughs> and the other thing is that we don't know, we're learning, this is sort of a an experiment or a learning enterprise too that we don't know why loons are getting stranded we have some good guesses there's some typical reasons but with each loon that we rescue we're learning a little bit about it so it's a humane response to the individual loon but it's also a chance to learn something and that's that's worthwhile too wonderful i think um that sounds like a wonderful place to end i know we didn't get to everybody's questions um but hopefully um, maybe they can email you or email us and we'll, we'll forward those along if um, your question went unanswered. But um, I just wanna thank you again, John, this is heroic work. Thank you to all of you and all of your collaborators um, in the fire departments and the Nordic skaters and all your staff, all the staff at the Loon Preservation Committee, Fish and Game, everyone involved. It's just really incredible and um, uplifting to hear about um, 
what people are doing to help our local wildlife. So thank you so much, John, and thanks to everyone for joining us. If you if we were all here in person, we'd be standing and, and clapping and um, we'll just do it virtually. But um, Well, I'm clapping back to the <laughs> folks uh, like you, Brett, who've been involved in these rescues. I'm seeing lots of names out there. So thanks for, for listening to my, my part of it. I'll look forward to being in touch with everybody about um, your questions and, and future, hopefully a few future rescues. <laughs> Wonderful. All right. Thanks all.